you today about continuous improvement based on data and the way an organisation, specifically Methodist Mission Southern, transformed when starting a data-based cultural change. Um, this is a brief um, um, overview of, of who we are and what we do. We're based in Otago and Southland with a little bit of incursion into South Canterbury. Um, we do $3.5 million a year. Uh, we've got 23 product lines grouped into three main disciplines across 11 locations. So we're stretched a wee bit thin right now, you can imagine. And I'm here to talk to you today about the lessons we learnt on the way to becoming what we call achievement-oriented, which is our board's language for the kind of outcomes things that you've been talking about today. Uh, before I start, I want to reassure you and myself that I don't have all of the answers. The mission is not doing any of this nearly well enough, and I'm hoping that you will leave this conference focused on how you can make the sector, the systems, and the mission better than it currently is. We call how we do what we do quality works. Uh, it's our in-house quality assurance productivity management system. It's applied across our three main disciplines, which are foundation education, early childhood education, and social work. It's not only a set of software tools and related processes, it is an attitude. The tools and processes vary by discipline, but the attitude is hopefully the same across all. And it is the anvil on which we have hammered out a different way of working for us over the last seven years. And it's based on these four key elements, evidence and research informed service planning, evidence and research informed service design, service delivery and service evaluation. So let's talk a little bit about the shifts that have generated this impact. So this is our transformation over the last seven years, and particularly in terms of social work, because I don't want to deluge you with the data from ECE and from Foundation Education. Let's, let's pick the easy one. Um, on the left is the number of sessions for impact. Prior to implementing quality works, it was about 13 sessions as a minimum. And generally, and I have to say this because it happened during my time, the client discharged themselves, maybe ahead, maybe not, but generally frustrated with us. Since we implemented Quality Works, it is 3.2 sessions for the first reason for service, an average two sessions for the second reason for service, and their intake score, the resiliency that they come to us with, is higher the second time around than it was the first time. So in terms of efficiency, I suppose, is what that graph represents, it's been transformative. On the right, this is the shift in the resiliency that we achieved. Before Quality Works, we didn't have a clue. And I would suspect this is true of most service providers in the industry. We have no idea of the real impact of the work that we're undertaking. Since we implemented Quality Works, well, we're doing quite well. The blue column is... Um, the statistically significant shift in the system that we use, which is PCOM's Partners for Change Outcome Management System. Six points across a range of 40 is considered statistically significant, and what that means is it's change that lasts. We're averaging nine. So I can talk about how long it takes to do the work, I can talk about the impact of the work that we do, and I can do it um, as it happens three times a day in real time. Now, making these changes cost us. The first implementation with the social workers uh, took three years and a 75% turnover in the workforce. And I uh, know most of the lawyers in town by first name basis now. <laughs> um, and the second implementation with our early childhood team took three months and we had a 0% turnover. And six months after we implemented, we happened to be running our mid-year appraisal system and what we heard universally from them was they didn't want to work any other way now. So I do want to, uh, if I can leave you with one thought, it's that having learnt how not to do this, we found a way to do it that worked. And the reason it took us three years and 75% of the workforce the first time around was because we had to build the entire system as we went. Yeah. So it was a bit like building a bicycle from scratch. We started off with the handlebars and were amazed that we weren't travelling. And then somebody found a bike seat. You know, and, and in all the gaps, the workforce found ways to object to what we were asking to have happen. By the time we got to the early childhood teachers, we had a complete bicycle. And there were no gaps. 
And so there was no option for them but to settle up, get onto it and see how far they could go. And be, um, and it did, it took it, we, we, I mean, I think we learned in every hard way that was possible um, uh, how not to do it. The first implementation we ran with the social workers and, and, and we said, how's it going? And they said, yes, yes, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. We thought, you know what, we'll, we'll just go and look. And we found out that they were giving themselves a 95% exception rate, which is not, we are doing it by any measure. The, the tools that we use rely on two forms. We found that they were using the one that checked in on how the client was doing at twice the rate that they were using the form that told them how the client thought they as a practitioner were going. So we had to build all of the IT systems, all of the checking, suck all the oxygen out um, in the most painful way possible. Probably because I'm a bit of a slow learner. So there was a great deal of movement on our part and I have two thoughts to offer you about that. Okay, so let's talk about these. I don't know if you've met Peter Drucker before. He's one of sort of the Harvard Business Review and Management Theology's um, great saints. And there's another version of his quote. Um, I've got an ex-military guy on my board who keeps popping up with um, military strategy. And there's a guy called von Moltke who was a Prussian general who wrote, who wrote the more cynical version of this, which is, no plan survives contact with the enemy which is Prussian 19th century management style, right? So let, let, let's think about this. If staff were already persuaded and enthusiastic for outcomes-led work, they would be doing it anyway. We all know or have known of people who ran their own system on top of the mandated one because they wanted an extra layer of information. And we all know um, of fantastically planned, incredibly expensive organisational reorientation projects that have failed. Harvard Business Review says that organisational change normally takes around five years to show positive benefit, and that's largely because that's how long it takes for the old guard to wash out and go on to other employers whose lives they illuminate, which isn't terribly affirming <laughs> of structure as the sole determinant. In fact, there's considerable evidence that outstanding workers can make even a bad structure function but that even the best of structures will stumble and fall in the hands of a mediocre operational attitude. Culture, not plans, make the difference. Culture is the thing that brings new talent in and exits poorly fitting talent. Culture is the thing that motivates and inspires. And culture, not plans, feeds a group of people so they become fit enough to do the good things. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, what are the instruments of culture and culture change. And I would suggest that carrot and stick options both need to be considered and object lessons factored in. I have become a massive fan of an early object lesson. And you need a way of checking if you're in on track, which brings us, I think, to, to Plato. Now, I've been fortunate enough to be on the periphery of conversations here in Wellington in the last few months about how to sustain iterative change in funding and administration of social services. And reflecting on the mission's journey, it has struck me that innovation generally comes from discomfort as well as causing it. And yet, I think it's equally true that people, particularly in groups, are generally oriented towards finding or at least expressing equilibrium. It's our innate thing to try and get something nailed down as fast as possible so that it's stable. System design to encourage innovation therefore needs to include some discomfort. And not just once to kick it off, but in some kind of ongoing form. And it's the kind of discomfort that says, yes, well, we measured that, but now we're measuring this. We've learned from that, and now we're stretching our goals again. I can see what you're doing, and I have a question. Please tell me about this bit you haven't considered yet. And what would it look like if we wanted to do this instead? If we are to have an achievement orientation in the social services sector, we also need to recognise that we are a long way from having a mature, deep, robust state of the art. There isn't a destination here at the moment, I believe. We're not going to get to a place where we can settle anytime soon, even travelling fast, where we will be able to say to ourselves, well, that's sorted then. 
finding the right discomfort for the right time and stage, searching for the surprises, never accepting because as an answer, and fighting the desire to settle, that is where the art and artistry lie. Now, you may be a bit surprised to hear somebody from the NGO sector saying this. And I'll confess that I've drunk the Kool-Aid here on one particular belief, and it is this. It is the clients who need to be at the centre of our work, not the staff. Having the staff feel comfortable is way less important to me than having clients who say this worked. And we are a generation away from being able to say that reliably. Because, as an employer, I can tell you that the workforce I draw from is light on evidence, light on research-backed tools, and that a great deal of iteration will be required before we can genuinely say we are doing the best possible for those we profess to help. It is not at all, in that case, difficult to embrace designed in necessity. So this is our system now, and it embraces a great deal of discomfort for the worker. The client and the worker and the manager can all see how the client is, how the work is going, and how or if the worker is helping in real time, three times a day. And they can see it at any time since the start of the work and all compared to the client's expectations and the research-derived KPI set by the mission. Now, it looks simple. It involves a lot of technology and it involves a lot of stub toes. But the summary of our shift to this is this. We changed where we got our inspiration, from the workers' view of social justice to the client's statement of their reality. We changed who was in charge from the worker, unsupported in the room, to the client and the manager collaborating through the worker. We focused on the markers of speed and direction and the things we didn't understand. We switched to changing the worker's internal processes, not the posters on the wall. We kept looking forward. We focused on the champions, our bright spots, and fed them, rather than being consumed by the don't want us. And I had this conversation um, at the Social Investment Unit today. Don't focus on the audience you have now. They won't be here in two or three years' time. Focus on the audience you want to have in two or three years' time when the change has been made. We exited the don't want us as fast as we could all of whom I'm pleased to report now have jobs and agencies where there's copious amounts of monitoring <laughs> and data, the things they rejected when we offered them. Um, we kept learning, uh, to be fair, more from the failures than the successes, and we remembered to laugh at ourselves, which is a kind of forgiveness that has become altogether too rare in change. So the results we planned for. At the beginning of the change process, we actually identified 78 elements of the mission's operations we thought would change, but I am not going to deal you with those. Um, there are five that I think are, are, are substantive. We thought we would change our organisational structure, grouping services by worker discipline and changing the division of management tasks. We thought that we would change how new product got developed. We thought it would become more rigorous, there'd be less guesswork and we'd hit the target more often. We knew we were going to change the reporting from our work, but very vaguely. We thought, we thought if we could just know a wee bit more about what we were doing, um, we would actually get confirmation that what we were doing was fabulous. And that certainly wasn't the truth. <laughs> and in actual fact, we helped implement our system with another agency a couple of months ago, and my IT guy came to me and said, oh, we've got the first results in of the, the data crunching for this agency, and it's not good. What am I going to say? And I said, what do, you, what do you mean it's not good? Is it, is it like garbage in, garbage out? Or it says that they're doing bad things. Oh, no, it's good quality data. They're doing bad things. <laughs> what, what do I tell them? And I said, you ring them up and you say, um, congratulations. Now you know. <laughs> like we did. And tell them how bad it was for us, because that'll make them feel like they're not alone. But tell them that they are finally in a position to do something about how bad they are in the way that we have done it, and that that gives them a market advantage because there will be nobody in their market who is doing better. And he came back to me half an hour later and said that I owed him wine, so that's good. <laughs> uh, we thought it would change the skills that we looked for in new staff, and we thought it would give us greater market penetration and income earning potential because good children get rewarded. And now, uh, this is the one of the 78 planned results that is yet to turn up. Um, <laughs> Uh, it looks like the next 18 months may provide some opportunities. 
And there were a whole lot of outcomes that turned up that we didn't expect, off-label remedies. There's a Yiddish proverb, man laughs, um, man plans and God laughs. And the list of unexpected outcomes is far larger than the list of planned ones. In brief, our entire induction process, which was focused on the first two days for new staff, migrated to focusing on the first couple of months and now starts before the first interview. Uh, the lag time for getting someone on board is a lot longer. Good, but a lot longer. Our recruitment processes for staff shifted from us trying, uh, to be honest, begging for someone to take the job, to us actively trying to discourage folks during the application process. We now start off by telling them how hard we are to work for, and that, that only gets tougher. Um, you know, why would we want somebody who thinks it's going to be easy? It, it's not. It's, it's, it's not. And the result is, instead of feeling grateful that we got anybody good enough to take the job, we now get applications from people we can't afford to hire. People in this sector want to make a difference. The good ones know that it's hard. It's a credibility test for them when we sit them down and say, this is messy. Thinking about what would change again if we could afford those folks is a mind bender all of its own for us. And we spend a lot of management time working out how we can shift our pricing structure to do that. In the last five years, our median staff performance has risen so much so that people who five years ago were in our top quartile are now routinely exiting from our bottom quartile in terms of performance, although their performance has not changed at all. As a result, our tools and our capability at the front line have grown by an order of magnitude. Folks now spend time on what didn't work rather than glossing over it because we know that there are nuggets of pure gold in the failures. Somehow staff have grown to expect that we will continually edit what we are doing so that it, was, it will be better tomorrow than it was today. And staff now talk about how clients achieve their goals. We never used to hear that. It was all about how the worker thought the client was doing better. Without us doing much to encourage it, we now have more senior staff setting up mentoring relationships with new staff. Our workers are less precious about who provided a good idea and more interested in whether it works. And they get that good enough is the enemy of perfect. Our culture is now much more how can I make this thing work than the older that's never going to work and I'm not doing it. Our relationships with other providers have shifted in a way we didn't anticipate. As we've gotten more and more achievement oriented, we have competed with other providers less, differentiating more and striking out on our own path. Now, I need to confess here, I don't think that makes them terribly comfortable. Deviation from the herd is not a trait that's well, well prioritised in the NGO sector. And um, but they get more referrals from us than ever before, and if a funder picks us over them, everybody knows it's because we're offered something that the other providers could never have put on the table and would never have gotten the contract. We were recently awarded a national contract for a tiny number of places in the scheme of things because the other provider, massive compared to us, had the rest of the country, we got a slice because we were the only innovative tenderer for the project. So it's true, our competitors are suspicious of us and we get less offers for collaboration than we used to with big providers. I get accused of being managerialist quite a lot by, by, by my colleagues. But smaller agencies are a lot happier to work with us. They trust that we are about the clients, not about the empire. And we also think about our business in quite different ways. We think about our markets and market behaviour, programme design, horizontal and vertical integration, client and work supply chains, scale and efficacy in very different ways than we used to. To be honest, that we think of them at all as a change. Last month, our business development leader, Jimmy, who you're going to meet this afternoon, I think, asked our practice leader, Charles, who will be hanging out with Jimmy this afternoon, how he would know a new service running remotely from our main campus was working. And Charles's response was this, the data will tell me. I've never heard a practitioner say that. As a result of that data, we now see gaps in our markets that we never would have seen before. We're looking to abandon one of our longest held services, which is highly programmatic, rather than fight an emerging oligopoly we can't beat, despite the fact that our product is high quality. We're going to diversify and extend to a much more flexible and ad hoc delivery because we have the management tools to be able to run that as a successful business model. 
But the most surprising thing to my mind in all of this is that we have wound up with a profoundly different sense of what the work actually is. Ten years ago, like most of the contracted sector, we provided standardised services that effectively commoditised the clients and achieved very little. You know, it's the sort of two CV of social services, two horsepower, any colour you like as long as it's black, and stopping only at South Dunedin and Invercargill, largely based on unproven and untested mid-late 20th century philosophies for social work. What we do now is completely different. We have tailored alliances with the clients that are acts of inspiration, skill and success, built from what the research and evidence say should work. And it's not about us anymore. It's about the people that we work with, the lives that they live, and their experience of their lives. And most importantly, their definitions of the problem and of the target and what constitutes success. And because of that, we're finally making a real difference. We know we are making a difference and we can show others the difference that we make. We get to go home most days proud of it. So, was it worth it? We have staff who resisted the changes who would now not work under any other system, including managers and board. Our median staff performance has improved out of sight. Innovation now comes to us from the front line as well as from managers. And we have clients who tell us they have never been listened to in the way they have with us. They get to graduate from social service support and we see them beginning to flourish under their own steam. Quality works at its best is the way the mission makes a real difference and we would not ever go back despite all the stresses of the first round of implementation. I can't wait to see where we get to next. Hopefully um, we'll get the reward that good children get at some point. But let me give you a flavour of some of the things that we're starting to play with now that a few years ago I could never have imagined. Shared services hubs, sharing our quality assurance mechanisms with small providers that can't afford to develop themselves. And I absolutely hear the point about niche and geographically remote and specialist providers under the kind of infrastructure requirements that shifting to outcomes brings. We're pulling together a package on child executive functioning for other early childhood centres and schools. We're looking at quality works as a way of helping schools manage national standards administration. And virtual reality software so we can teach literacy and numeracy to small groups of people in rural areas. These are the big innovations. Small ones seem to happen every day. What we do now is change that works, the tagline that we set ourselves back when we had a list of 78 things we hoped would change. You bet it was worth it. Thank you.